So there it was driving on a nice day like today when smoke started to fill the cabin. I was close to home, so I pulled over and I found out that if I turned off the air conditioning vents, smoke went away. Hey, probably the heater core. Looked down at the bottom, smoke still came out of a hole, so I put a piece of tape over it until I decided it was time to uh, crack open the dash. Follow along as we do a deep dive into the process. To start the heater core replacement, we're going to disconnect the battery. We're going to mess with the wiring. Then loosen the clamps and remove the coolant hoses going to the heater core. After that, we want to loosen and push back the glove box liner. I'll let that vent hose go ahead and fall down. With the liner loose, we're able to remove the glove box light so that the glove box liner can slide out without an issue. Next up is the center vent. After it's removed, this plenum can be removed. Next up, knobs come off of the radio, then nuts, then the radio faceplate will come off. After that, the ashtray has screws at the top and the bottom. Once the ashtray is down, remove the illumination lamp and wiring to the 12 volt socket. Next up, we need to figure out why the miniature schnauzer wants some attention. The radio is secured by two screws at the bottom. Once the radio is pulled out, the speaker antenna is disconnected. Two screws secure the speaker and defroster grill, and then it's able to be carefully lifted out. Watch out for the wiring harness as it comes out. Make sure you have a clean spot to organize everything coming out of the car. Now we have to go deeper in the dash to remove what Buick calls the distribution duct assembly. Start by taking off the plastic deflector that is screwed into the metal assembly that gets heat to the back. We'll need this so the plenum can come down. The plenum is secured to the bottom of the dash by two screws, one on the left, one on the right. What's got to happen next is this thing that resembles a giant rubber band needs to be pulled back. The vent to the driver's side gets disconnected, and then you can gently rock that plenum down out of position. Handle it gingerly. 50 year old fiberglass can crack on you. Next we're going to remove this carpet trim ring to get to the assembly under the carpet. Here are some pictures I took from a previous replacement so you can see what you'll be up against. In this assembly is a door to push heat to the back. My cables are secured by tie wraps because the screws broke a long time ago. Remove the accelerator pedal by rocking it and pulling it firmly, and that will allow you to access the screws to be able to remove the metal reinforcement plate from the car. Then there'll be screws at the top, the right side, and the left side. A little gentle persuasion will be needed, and the metal assembly can be finessed away from the plastic and metal pans that distribute heat to the rear of the car. Once the metal was out of the way, I could see where the heater core had been leaking. Now we're again on the right side of the dash, disconnecting the wiring, the vacuum hoses, and then the control cable from the heater box. Everything removed is controlled by the air lever. Specifically, the top is a vacuum switch and the bottom an electrical one to turn all climate control on or off. The switch to the left changes fan speed. Now we'll move on to disconnecting the defroster control, which is on the left side of the dash. The green cable is one of the controls and is disconnected. This is a great time to remove this little heat outlet for the driver. And above that is a vacuum diaphragm, which needs the vacuum hose disconnected. Now we move on to the temp control, and those cables are in the middle of the dash. There are two of them that you'll need to remove. In that same area, you'll see this max AC switch, and if yours has vacuum hoses, disconnect. In addition, I have an FM to AM modulator that I need to move out of the way. Here's a preview of what we're about to remove. There's a fastener at the bottom left that will come out, and then there's a hidden fastener within the heater box itself. If you miss this one, you'll be breaking some fiberglass. And way in the back, there's another bolt that will need some extensions to remove. The majority of the bolts on the right side will go from the engine compartment into the passenger compartment so you'll need to go under the hood to remove them. One of the easy ways to tell a heater box bolt is a smaller washer on it. There's a single bolt on the right hand side that's in the passenger compartment. After removing it, the box can be rocked out of the way. I've got a towel under it to catch any stray coolant. Now that the box is out of the car, I just need to get it over to the bench so we can get it split in half to actually get at the heater core within. The heater box is two halves, held together with a bunch of screws that are hex head. 
you'll need to remove many of these screws and then with gentle persuasion the two halves should separate. Now there are four screws to remove to allow the brackets that hold the heater core to the fiberglass to come out. I recommend you paint these if there's any corrosion on them. We finally made it down to the actual heater core that can be removed for replacement. Here are the rest of the parts that came out of the car. There are a couple of problem spots that are evident now that we can see the actual core. Even with the coolant filter, this heater core still harbored rust that you can see once I ran some water through it. I'm really big on keeping track of warranties, and when I purchased this, it had a lifetime one. I packed it up, grabbed my receipt, and headed to the auto parts store. In less than a week, walked out with a brand new one for zero dollars. While I was waiting for it to arrive, I did buy these bypass caps to put on the hose connections to hold the coolant so I could still drive Sherman. The heater core carries a CarQuest 399062 part number, but the paperwork inside says it is made by Thermal Solutions Manufacturing. The only packing material in the box was this paper, which you can see was inadequate and caused some minor damage. Next, I removed the old gasketing from the inside and outside of the heater core. The new heater core is put in place and there's no way to get this wrong because of how the pipes are soldered on. Now I reinstall the U-shaped brackets that keep the heater core safely in place. I'm going to use Ultra Black Gasket Maker to put a bead around the heater box. This isn't that critical because it's just keeping heat out of the passenger compartment when you don't want it. What is critical is to seal around the pipe so underhood fumes don't make it in. The two halves are brought together and secured, and then I like to add a little extra gasket maker to this area that usually doesn't seal well. Next I apply Gasket Maker to the side that will contact the firewall. As the heater box is lifted in place, pay attention to the top where it meets the defroster duct. Next, the reassembly is really opposite of the disassembly. If you don't remember where some of the wires or cables go, I've got drawings on my website at 1964buick.com. I'm taking a little time to clean up my wire harness. After I got the distribution duct back in place, it was time to switch to the top side. My glove box opening had been cracked for years and I previously tried to fix the hinges with some chunky aluminum. I had another glove box on hand so I decided to go ahead and change it while I had all the space to work. The courtesy light will have to come out as well as two nuts behind the dash for the assembly to be removed. Here is the factory one and here is the replacement. Everything will have to be transferred between the two. While I had the AC vent removed, I went ahead and took it apart and removed the ball to get to where the felt should be to hold the ball in position. You can see I'm missing about three quarters of it. I picked up bulk felt at the craft store and cut it to width. Spray adhesive on the felt and in the vent allowed me to install the new strip. Once I put the vent back in the dash, I made new, thinner reinforcement bars for the opening. These glove box have been breaking since 1964 Buick actually published a service bulletin detailing this exact repair. Once the AC hose is attached, the whole assembly gets reinstalled in the car. I'd previously replaced my courtesy light with an LED. I didn't like the color. I did it because these lamp holders always crack the insulator. I fabricated a new insulator out of heavy plastic, cut the wires, brought them through, and reconnectorized them. Here's the finished incandescent product. Courtesy light and wiring to the glove box are in a two terminal connector in the dash which pushes together. With the glove box opening replaced, I was able to move on to the other components. It's time to replace the glove box liner and I've got the original one that is really tired and doesn't look that great. About a decade ago, I reached out to the guys at Repop Cinema Glove Box and they made one for me. It's not perfect. It's missing the piping at the front and it doesn't have flocking on the inside. But I think I'm going to go ahead and go with this one, just so it'll look better. Before I install the liner, I'm gluing a switch to the bottom of the door to replace the factory one that always made the glove box hard to close. It's a mercury switch, which uses liquid metal to disconnect the light when the glove box is closed. It's the same technology the trunk light uses. I built an aluminum housing for the switch to protect it from physical damage, and then I painted it to match the inside of the box. Once the gasket maker dried, the output from the mercury switch is connected to the light and the original supply ground is connected to the input terminal of the new switch. The trunk release hole is knocked out of the liner. The light is pushed through and then the vacuum hose. I had the best luck installing the glove box by turning it sideways and then straightening it up. The glove box light is secured by two screws. The world's best reproduction missed a screw hole, but DeWalt gladly makes a new one. The optional trunk release is installed and tested and I toss my registration and insurance cards in my favorite spot. 
I test the mercury switch and it turns the light off just like it should. Last step is to put the lucky schnauzer in place. The heater core's in, now it's time to test it. And of course it's a nearly 90 degree day, so it's a good time to test the heat. So we're gonna put the temperature all the way down. We're gonna put the air to the highest setting. I'm gonna switch this over to heat, although it actually doesn't make a difference in this type of Buick. And uh, we're gonna see if we get warmed up or not. All right, according to the thermometer, we've got heat again. Now I've checked for coolant leaks and I've checked the level. Now I'm going to enjoy it and hope I can make it another 12 years before I got to put a heater core in again. Thank you so much for watching.